So tonight, the aim is to go at least a bit deeper into where Freud's heart was. He was not a person who would reveal too much about himself in his later years. In the beginning, some of his works are mostly autobiographical. If you read the interpretation of dreams, most of the dreams are Freud's own dreams. And then, as years go by, he becomes more and more secluded, has less and less friends, and in his friendships, he is like moving toward the dismissive attachment pattern. So if we want to discover where his heart was, one huge passion in his life was psychoanalysis and building the psychoanalytic movement and spreading it around the globe and so on. And another one that might show us something about the man is what he liked in the world of arts. So I'll start with a very brief reminder of what we talked about last week. And then we'll go into details about Freud's collection of antiquities. I brought you one book to see more details. And then about Freud's passion for Michelangelo. And finally, the largest part of this will be about the person who somehow was Freud's obsession. And that is, who was William Shakespeare and why his work was important. No. So, this is our series. This is where we are tonight. We talked about the basics, now we move to details, and the next two weeks will be about Freud's meetings with two artistic geniuses of his time. We'll go then really into tiny details. So, a brief reminder, very, very brief reminder of the last week. This is the timeline. Freud was born 1856, so mid-19th century, and died in London in 1939. From the age of three, he lived in Vienna, was a brilliant medical student there, then had to give up the university career and start the private practice, lived in Vienna for basically 79, 78, 79 years, moved to London, and after less than 15 or 16 months, died in London. This is the, the house where he was born. Freud died in the house where now is Sigmund Freud Museum in Hampstead, and it was basically assisted suicide. He suffered from cancer for 15 years. When it was too much, his doctor injected double dosage of morphine, so Freud died of overdose. This is Freud as a child. You can see him portrayed. This is a painting with the book in his hand. He spoke many languages. He was uh, extremely good in Latin and Greek and so on and so on. When he was passing his abitur, the task was to translate 33 verses from the Oedipus by Sophocles, from Greek to to German, and he was commended for doing the job in an excellent way. Freud's passion were romantic poets and Shakespeare, very specifically. Freud believed he was a natural scientist, and he believed he was a conquistador. He had the temperament of a person who conquers foreign continents. Yet this is the study, as you can see it in London, and I, I advise you to do so in your next travel to London. This is the famous couch. This is the desk. Behind it, this way, is the bookshelf. And these are the antiquities. Freud was at any moment of his working life surrounded by sculptures and paintings. One. His brother-in-law, his wife's brother, was a merchant in carpets. So these are also, in a way, artistic works from, I think, Iran, nowadays Iran. And Freud claimed he would not be able to write otherwise. For thinking and for writing, it was necessary to have all these sculptures on his desk 
and very specifically the sculpture of Athens, Greek goddess of wisdom and many other things. Athens traveled from Vienna to London smuggled by Princess Marie Bonaparte, who was analyzed by Freud and became a very important supporter and paid for his travel, and she smuggled the sculpture. The collection was traveling by train. There was a danger the Nazis would confiscate it. So that could be survived somehow. But to be, to, to live the rest of the life without the Athens, that was not survivable. So she had to be, or it had to be smuggled the other way. On this way, it lost the spare. Initially, the, the, the sculpture had the spare, it was lost during the smuggling process. So, we turn to our topic for today, Antiquities, Michelangelo and Shakespeare. Freud's collection of antiquities, of which you see just a small part here, counted more than 2,000 pieces. I don't think any one of us here present will ever own one. It, it is difficult for me to understand that any one of us will be rich enough to be able to buy any of these nowadays. At that time, a bit more than 100 years ago, Freud had six children and private practice was not rich in any meaning of the term, yet he had private consultants from the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna who would come to his home, look at a piece and tell him this is original or not, this is very valuable, this century and so on and so on. At that time, that was not impossible. To give you a comparison very briefly, a collection of a really rich person is the Morgan Library on Manhattan. If you've ever been there, then you've seen Folio Shakespeare's and Gutenberg Bibles and Beethoven manuscripts and so on and so on. That's being really rich. Some things have changed in the meantime. Yet Freud's collection is still important enough for people to write books about it. I will show you I hope you can see it well from here. So this is a Sphinx. So this is an Egyptian original, could be three or four thousand years old. The information is somewhere inside. I, I don't know if this moment. And these are also Egyptian originals. So probably three or four thousand years old. And then this is this is Roman, it says, from France or the Rhineland, 1st or 2nd century AD, bronze. And this one here is Greek, classical period, early 4th century BC. So that's what Freud was surrounded by every day. This is his uh, bookshelf, so that's on the opposite wall from the couch. The books are mostly about archaeology. And Freud wrote, I've read more books about archaeology than about psychology. And you see again a cabinet here, mostly Egyptian, and here more sculptures. Whatever you see is original. So it is not as if I would like to make a collection today, I would simply have to buy plaster copies, which are probably 20 euro. In Freud's case, all of these were originals. You could put them in the Altus Museum. I think no one would say this is worse than their current exhibition. These would go to the Neues Museum, to the Egypt collection. And there is China as well. And so on. If you want to look at the book, I can give it to Leonie, it can be in the library for some time, if any one of you would like. There are excellent essays in it as well. If anyone wants to work on it, I can, I can borrow it to the library for a couple of weeks. Just let me know after the lecture. Imagine you've never heard about Freud in psychoanalysis. 
but you're interested in art history. It may easily happen that you travel to London and you go to visit the house just to see the collection. It is important enough for you to do that. This book was done by Lynn Gamble many years ago when the collection was on its American tour. And then it was exhibited in the best American museums and attracted a lot of attention. What is the point about this all? Why do we care about it? One level, Freud believed that collecting is definitely connected somehow, related somehow, to the anal phase of development and might be connected to the obsessive compulsive disorder. He believed that people who are frustrated and then develop a fixation point at the anal phase of development would be very stubborn, would be very focused on the money and saving it and counting it and having it and so on, and then on cleanliness and then on collecting. So any sort of collection, stamps, uh, coins, whatever it might be, Freud would think about how is this connected to the obsessive defenses this person might employ when faced with anxiety. But is Freud's collection simply a symptom, a product of his possible anal fixation? One additional point to all this is that Freud understood psychoanalysis as a discipline absolutely parallel to archaeology. Freud had many heroes in his youth, and among them were some of the most famous archaeologists of his time, most notably Heinrich Schlieven. Schlieven was extremely famous at that time, he was German, and got rich very young, and then gave up business and everything, and moved to Athens, and his life's dream was to find Troy. So he traveled to Asia Minor, and for years he married the Greek woman and was better in classical Greek than the Greeks themselves, and so on and so on. Schliemann had a method, self-invented method, to learn a language in six weeks. So he spoke between 10 and 15 languages. He had translators in Turkey and got dissatisfied and then learned Turkish, and then he negotiated with the authorities. A man of iron will, they, they called him. So Schliemann one day finally did discover Troy. And that was early enough that he didn't know the methods of archaeology that we have today. So he was digging. And by rough, fast digging, he was breaking many important things. Later on, it turned out that there were layers and layers of the settlement. So on the ninth level, the streets were like this. And on the eighth level, the streets were different. On the seventh level, you would find pottery and so on and so on. And this story was so exciting for Freud. And I remind you, last week I told you, when he was already in London, Freud could recite the beginning of Homer's Iliad in Greek. Tens, dozens of verses he had in his memory. That's how important it was for him. So he got very excited by Schliemann's discovery and all the descriptions of Troy that he started thinking about psychoanalysis in the same way. Psychoanalysis, in Freud's opinion, was an archaeological science. The unconscious, or the mind as a whole, is organized in the same way as Troy. At the surface, there is the consciousness, the least interesting, if you ask Freud. Then the second layer is the preconscious. Then the third layer is the first repress, re, layer of the first repressed material beneath the censorship barrier. 
And then you can go further deep through the unconscious until you find the primal repression. So Freud believed what psychoanalysts do is basically the job of the archaeologist. You start by trying to figure out what is in the consciousness of your patient at this moment. Then you ask for free associations and then you try to see what's in the preconscious. Then you ask about dreams, you observe the transference, you observe uh, uh, the mistakes the patients made and, and communication patterns and then you learn about the unconscious. Whatever comes from the unconscious will come from a certain layer. Adult, childhood, related to early trauma, related to current stress or this or that. Troy didn't use the word stress, but... When you are talking to your patient, then you never try to go several layers in depth. But you start from surface and then you go layer by layer <coughs> downwards. So you start, usually they say it's four steps. Current consciousness, current unconsciousness, past consciousness, past unconsciousness. So first you want to see what your patient thinks today. And then you want to see what is it today that your patient cannot think about. Then you want you to see what your patient thought, let's say, 25 years ago. And then you want to see what he or she was not able to think about 25 years ago. That's how you try to collect the puzzle. For Freud, that was basically the archaeology. What you find in the unconscious are archaeological layers. Do you see any problems with this? Last week you were very silent. Now it would be good to, to be more interactive. Is there a methodological problem with this? Yes. Which one? That by trying to go into a state that is in the past, it already like, implies the act. It is you already? By your, state, your state now, you cannot go into the past without you can manage what happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very soon the problem of psychological truth and real truth, if you will, appeared. How I remember my childhood might be in the service of my current moment, my symptoms, my trauma, and so on and so on. Can I tell you what really happened? Does it really matter? Do you treat me and my psychological contents and what I remember, or you try to deal with the situation as it is? then everything that happened years ago has layers of what happened afterwards over it. So, is it broken in the meantime? Can I really see it, even if I try my best? But the most important problem that was introduced in psychoanalysis later on is the introduction of the relational model, where the basic, the most important things are not buried inside of me, but are revealed in the dialogue. That's why this model became less important in the decades that came. Another point, very important when it comes to Freud's collection, is that this is the collection mostly of Roman, Etruscan, Greek and Egyptian art. Is there anything missing from the list? Sorry? The ancient Hebrews? Yes. The Judeo-Christian tradition is not present in it in any way. So when you look at Freud in his study, there is everything but what's related to his family history. So now, as there are hundreds if not thousands of people who are writing their dissertations in every tiny detail about Freud, I, I hope I mentioned that last week, there is no one in the world who's ever been studied in so many biographies as Freud. Did I tell you that? Most books in the world written about two persons, Freud and Hamlet. Hamlet. 
So someone found out that Freud started to build his collection a year after his father died. So that's 1897. When Freud's father died, Freud passed through a period probably of a serious depression. And he then started his self-analysis and came to many important insights. One of the important things that happened in this period, Freud decided not to perform the ritual that is expected from the son after the father's death. To the best of our knowledge, Freud never circumcised his, never had his son circumcised, and he referred to himself later on as a godless Jew. He was Jewish by origin, but didn't have, didn't want to have anything to do with religion or rituals or community. <coughs> when he was a small boy, like seven years old probably, his father would spend some time with him almost every day in the evening reading Torah. So his father gave him the introduction into religious studies. And what was most important, when Freud was a boy, his father told him a story about walking in Vienna and Vienna as some historians say, is, not just was, but is, endemically anti-Semitic. Anything can happen in Vienna. They say anything can happen to a Hungarian, but Hungarians cannot lose their accent. Anything can happen in Vienna, but they cannot lose their anti-Semitism. So, pavements were for Aryans, because they were clean. Streets where carriages and horses would go were spoiled, were dirty, so they were for Jews. Freud's father dressed so that everyone would be able to recognize his Jewish origin, walked on the pavement. Someone came to him, tossed his hat, the hat fell onto the street, into the dirt, and told him something like, Go where you belong, Jew. And Freud, who was a small boy, asked his father, and what did you do then? And he hoped, he tells us, that his father rebelled, protested. But his father said, what could I do? I took my hat and continued my way. So Freud... Many years, late, many years later, said he was very disappointed and he started imagining himself as Hannibal. He evoked in his mind the situation when Hannibal, as a small boy, tells his father that he will never stop fighting Rome and that one day he will conquer Rome. So Freud, as a boy, starts hating Catholic Vienna and Catholic Rome. He doesn't want to be identified with his Jewish origin. He wants to be strong. He wants to be powerful. So he starts identifying with the enemies of Rome and with those who fight and want to conquer it. So that's another level of the explanation why the collection could have been important. Freud traveled really a lot, even to the United States. At that time, it was complicated to travel to the US. And he traveled to the Adriatic coast everywhere, into Sicily, into Holland, into Czech Republic, and to Berlin many times, and here and there into Paris, of course. He spent one year in Paris. He traveled to Manchester as a young man, but he couldn't travel to Rome. It happened to him that he starts his travel to Rome, he's on the train, and then neurotic symptoms start, and he stops the traveler and returns home. 
So he believed he suffered from something that he called Roman neurosis. Whoever has seen the beauties of the city probably cannot really understand it. But it took him years to be able to travel to Rome. Before that, he had a series of what he called Roman dreams. So Rome was extremely important for Freud psychologically. What happens when Freud, with his Roman neurosis, finally comes to Rome? Of all there is in Rome, this is the focus of Freud's attention. Can you recognize it? <clears throat> there is a church called San Pietro in Vincoli, St. Peter in chains. You can see some chains there, allegedly. These were the chains that St. Peter was uh, chained by almost 2,000 years ago. Allegedly, these are the originals. And in the church is the Moses by Michelangelo. <clears throat> now, try to think of all the miracles in Rome. Would you choose this one? Any other ideas? What would, you, what would be your personal preference in Rome? Leaving gelato aside. I'm thinking of a, a church, a basilic, where you have different levels too. Because uh, actually Christianity managed to uh, developed so very fast in Rome because it installed itself in a very, a very old, uh, oh, it's difficult to <coughs> on very, uh, very old uh, things uh, like Eastern which, uh, parties which already existed. And then there's this basilic where you can go very deep and see how... What's its name? I don't remember the name. And you can see the, the basilic 500 years before mm -hmm. uh, Birth of Christianity, then a second mm -hmm. level with another one. So it's quite what you explained about archaeology. Mm -hmm. You did, you did, and they managed because they installed themselves in something yeah. culturally already very developed. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah, that would be an interesting topic if we would go into the Christianity, but I don't dare to. <laughs> Any other ideas? What would be your focus if you would be to travel to Rome on Friday? What would you like to see most? Yes, the Colosseum. Colosseum? Yeah. Okay. Other ideas? Trevi Sorry? Trevi okay. Fontana di Trevi, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sixteen Chapel, you like it? They, they, they call it now, Sixteen Chapel, they call it now after the restoration, the Benetton Michelangelo. The colors are now so strong, like a commercial for Benetton. Pantheon, I agree completely. It's, it, it, it's amazing, with the Raphael of grave in it. Other ideas? St. Peter's, and then Bernini's everywhere, and then Canova's everywhere, and the magnificent squares like Piazza Navona, and so on and so on. It's beyond description, I think. For Freud, to have chosen this one, there must have been a very important reason. Why did Freud choose Michelangelo to be his focus in Rome? I am not puzzled by. Can you see them well enough in this light? This is the sculpture and these are Freud's drawings. Freud spent hours and hours in the church making these drawings and trying to figure out what the sculpture was about. I would like to show you something that's a bit off the topic, just to show you why it is not puzzling that Freud chose Michelangelo. So if there is anything beautiful in this world, then it's this. You've seen it probably. It's in St. Peter's, 
You go across a huge square and then you enter a huge church built with the idea to be the largest. And then in the church you find this. Even if you've seen it once, I, I found it difficult to believe that you would forget it. But like this, probably no one of us will ever see it. It is behind glass now and you cannot approach it and you cannot see it from all the angles. So this is marble, as you can see it here. This is a very rough, heavy, difficult to mold stone that's transformed into this. If there is a metaphor for sublimation that we discussed last week, then it's the sculpture by Michelangelo or Rodin. Now look at details, at the tiny and fragile details that are made of this heavy and hard stone that survived for more than five centuries now. And look at psychology. Look how alive the contact between the hand and the body is. And look at all the details and any, any element of this and look on faces. This is one of the angles that we will never be able to see, unfortunately. But there is a special question about this. How old is she? What's your impression when you look at the face? How old is this face? How young? Hmm? 12, 13 to 17, 18. <coughs> Yet we know it for a fact that what he is describing here is a scene when her son is 33. So she should be 50 -ish. So whenever you write your essays or prepare your presentations or whatever and think details are not important, just remember this. Every tiny, tiniest detail is perfection.
Is it obvious why Freud was fascinated by Michelangelo? So this is culture. And probably the most amazing one ever. But Michelangelo, besides all this, was a painter, as the 16, 16 Chapel testifies, was an architect who contributed to the St. Peter's and many other buildings, and was a poet. And if you read his sonnets, they're extraordinary. Some claim that for the last eight years of his life, he didn't wash himself a single time. He was too preoccupied with the painting. Sixteen Chapel is huge. To do just this in one lifetime is unbelievable. And that he so much didn't care about humans and relationships and social life that he didn't care about being stinky and so on. The same story about Beethoven and so on. So no doubt Freud easily could have been fascinated by Michelangelo. But then, why Moses and not any other of the sculptures, paintings, poems, personal life and so on? So these are Freud's letters. I pay a visit every day to the Moses in San Pietro in Vincoli, about which I may perhaps write a few words. The year is 1913. Before World War I, Freud is 56 years old, 57 years old. Psychoanalysis already lives, the International Psychoanalytic Association is developed, and so on and so on. He's an important and recognized author, and some people see him as a messiah. Every day for three lonely weeks of September 1913, which is a mistake for 1912, I stood in the church in front of the statue, studying it, measuring it, and drawing it, until there dawned on me that understanding which I expressed in my essay, though I only dared to do so anonymously. It was only much later that I legitimized this non-analytical child. <coughs> I find this very unusual for Freud. He published, as I told you last week, 23 volumes. And just one paper in all the 23 volumes was published anonymously. And that's this one, Michelangelo. It was published in 1914 in a psychoanalytic journal called Imago. It was a journal, the first, the oldest psychoanalytic journal, devoted to psychoanalysis and humanities. It was not a clinical psychoanalytic journal. And in this journal, Freud's closest collaborators must have known it was his paper. Yet he decided other people should not know it was his. Very unusual. And then he uses expressions that refer to children, like papers are his children, and this one is not his legitimate child because it's non-analytical. Before that, he had published papers with Leonardo on Gradiva that we mentioned last week, yet this one was somehow particularly unusual. This is how he opens the essay. I may say at once that I am no connoisseur in art, but simply a layman. I have often observed that the subject matter of works of art has a stronger attraction for me than their formal and technical qualities, though to the artist their value lies first and foremost in these latter. Nevertheless, Works of art do exercise a powerful effect on me, especially those of literature and sculpture, less often of painting. So Freud starts the essay, these are very first sentences, in a false tone of a person who very modestly says, I don't really know anything about this, but hear me out. And then he tells us he is into literature and sculpture and a little bit into painting. And we'll return to that later on. Now, one of the reasons for this is that it opens the possibility for paragraphs like this one. 
Let us consider Shakespeare's masterpiece, Hamlet, a play now over three centuries old. I have followed the literature of psychoanalysis closely, imagine this from Freud, and I accept its claim that it was not until the material of the tragedy had been traced back by psychoanalysis to the Oedipus theme that the mystery of its effect was at last explained. So it looks like an anonymous email in which you brag about yourself, but you don't want to say your name, but you say, and and thinks that I'm very handsome, tall, smart, and so on. So imagine Freud anonymously saying, I have followed the literature of psychoanalysis closely. At this point, 1914, 95% of psychoanalytic literature are his papers. <laughs> I mean, what did he have to follow closely other than that? A couple of papers by Adler, a couple of papers by Jung, a couple of papers by other people. 95% of everything is his at that moment. So, very strange. And then, this is not published in a journal for lay audience or for natural scientists, but in Imago, that is read by psychoanalysts. So why does he want to persuade them anonymously? when his authority is already so strong that they believe him in everything. Very unusual. Mm -hmm. And why does he say that it's not a non-analytical child? The paper is non-analytical child. Yeah, why? Because I think, because it is an applied paper. Because it is a paper not about patients, the unconscious, the mechanisms, but about the work of art. It is, again, funny he didn't say that about Leonardo paper and about Gradiva paper. Is there much difference between the papers on the slide? Like the Leonardo paper and the unconscious paper? Leonardo paper is, is indeed more about Leonardo's unconscious. His childhood memories and then what could they mean and which defense mechanisms and so on and so on. I'll turn very, very soon to what the, the intended, the conscious purpose of the Michelangelo paper was. It was to realize which effect Michelangelo wanted to produce in the viewer. It is, to a certain extent, different. This is the paper where Freud revealed for the first time something that we discussed last week, that he was closed to music and mysticism and everything that uh, resembled him of that. So, again, trying to apprehend them in my own way, that is, to explain to myself what their effect is due to. When, wherever I cannot do this, as for instance with music, I'm almost incapable of obtaining any pleasure. Some rationalistic or perhaps analytic turn of mind in me rebels against being moved by a thing without knowing why I am thus affected, and what is it that affects me. So he tells us in this essay at the very beginning, anonymously, that he needs to be in control. If the nature of the art is such that the art could bring him, so to say, then he refuses. He is, as I said, similar to the dismissive attachment pattern. As long as he, as he can be in control rationally, then he can find some enjoyment. When you think of art, what is the rational way of enjoyment that you find dearest? How do you enjoy your arts rationally? Wherever I cannot do this, as for instance with music, I'm almost incapable of obtaining any pleasure. Some rationalistic or perhaps analytic turn of mind. Interpreting it? Yeah. What kind of pleasure does it give you? What kind of pleasure does it give you? Um, it's truly analytical. And, and the difference is analytical. It's, it's um, sort of almost scientific. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, rational, you want to be with your interpretation. Scientific pleasure. Almost. Scientific pleasure. Yeah. Scientific pleasure. You recognize how unusual that phrase is. Yes? It's like, I think you're trying to grasp something in a uh, language that that you you know and so you are touched by something that is that that you perceive in a language you don't well mm -hmm. the language you don't you don't have yourself. to translate it into yeah. your personal language so to say. Yeah. Okay. 
Other ideas? Maybe that could be because I was doing a shared experience. I just had similar thoughts of you to what you were having and then mm -hmm. found a way to express it in a way you couldn't. Mm -hmm. You read other people's interpretations and then you are in dialogue with them. Yeah. You challenge them, you agree with them, and so on and so on. Yeah, like if you've like been through something and then you see or read a poem or just hear a song about it or something mm -hmm. else, that just that feeling that other people have the same. Or uh -huh. feelings or uh -huh. Okay, but you are on the level of feelings. Oh, yeah, okay. Freud is on the level of rational, perhaps analytic. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas about rational pleasure when exposed to arts? There's something uh, about putting art in its historic context to sort mm -hmm. of de genusify it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It what it. kind of pleasure does it give you? Mm -hmm. uh, if I look at like very uh, orientalist art, for me it gives me pleasure to, to feel that it's actually shit. Mm -hmm. Because it's just projection of sort of the consciousness of the painter and actually is not historically accurate mm -hmm. at all. And that, yeah, it sort of it makes it, uh, for me, uh, I feel less distant from it mm -hmm. as I can analyze it. Uh -huh. When you analyze it, you're less distant. Yeah. Okay. So how about what is it that Freud might be losing due to this attitude? What else is there but the rationalistic enjoyment? The ecstatic enjoyment. Sorry? Ecstatic enjoyment. Ecstatic enjoyment? Like? Mm. The thing to what I mm. Less than two weeks ago, I happened to be in New York. And by some miracle, I managed to buy a ticket for a Keith Jarrett concert. Recognize the name of Keith Jarrett? So Keith Jarrett is this very, very unique guy who comes to the stage. There's just a piano on the stage. And he has no idea what he will play. He sits at the piano, he starts playing something, has no idea which way that will bring him. And he does it for 40 something years. If you look at his CDs, they're usually called Live in Bremen, Live in Vienna, and so on. And the compositions are usually entitled January 25th, number one, January 25th, number two, and so on, when he plays solo. And if you, if you look at one of his, <coughs> I mean, if you look at one of the videos of his concerts on YouTube, you will see that there are moments when he stands up and start plays, but starts stumping his feet and sings. Maybe singing is not really the most accurate word for the sound he produces during that time. But it always seemed to me he had no idea where exactly he was. He maybe had no real idea that audience was around him. He must have had a very deep idea about harmony and contrapunct and whatever is inside the music, but he had no idea of what was outside the music, at least for several minutes. It's very difficult for me, I, I, I have to admit I envy him, it's very difficult for me even to imagine this ecstatic side of music making. Yeah, the that may happen. And the would like to that may happen, yes. Uh, I, well, I feel it like a connection. Like mm. when the artist wants mm. to connect with something outside or with, our, uh, with us or with himself. Mm. And this can be only global, not yeah. details. So, I guess we can, we can easily agree. Freud was excellent in some of these that he liked and missed a lot on the other side. Yet the other side needs what Freud was good at, at least to a certain extent. Just what's important to understand Freud, I think, is to have this quotation in mind. This Moses, let me return to it if you will. 
this Moses if you can see him correctly here is huge extremely tall and extremely strong you've seen it in Rome so you remember how huge it is or how huge he is and that might be the first of the questions why why is it important to present him like that why is he like a gladiator then another point was the idea that his head is not in fact the head of a Moses but the head of Pan of this Greek mythological being who plays and by music can control or, or calm down all the animals. If that's true, then what is the idea? Why present probably the most important figure of the Old Testament confused with a minor and a completely different being from a Greek mythology? Another question was, what about the horns? coming out of the head. What does it have to do with Michelangelo? Is it the devil? Is it the goat? What is this all about? <coughs> Another question was, I, I, I've intentionally chosen this photograph. So you can see here that the postament is like here, very low. The sculpture is not on a high pedestal so that its size dominates even more. It stays near to the floor. So 19th century saw various interpretations. What is this going on with this sculpture? And then Freud, when he finally managed to travel to Rome, visited the church every day for three weeks to see what was the mental constellation or emotional attitude that the artist had aimed to awaken in the viewer. So you see now different than what we talked last week. We saw that Gradiva was a novel that Freud analyzed in order to illustrate some psychoanalytic notions. Leonardo paper was the paper about the genius and his childhood recollections and the influence of his childhood recollections on his art. Michelangelo paper is the paper of how the artist wants to influence us. So Freud asks methodologically completely different questions when it comes to art. Wherever you look around Freud, you will find Shakespeare. That, again, is not very unusual. As I've tried to show you the genius of Michelangelo, it would probably be possible to use several days, countless hours, to illustrate the genius of Shakespeare. There is a whole discipline today called reading Freud's reading. People read the books that Freud read and then provide interpretation. How could these influence Freud? <coughs> if you take these books from the shelves, you will find Freud's notes on margins. I've, I've been privileged, maybe is the word to say, to look at a couple of Leonardo books, the books about Leonardo, and you could see that Freud was making markings. Remember it for the two weeks from today. When you turn around from Freud's desk, this is what you see. The central position is for the photograph of Lou Andrea Salome. She will be one of the main characters of the story we'll talk about two weeks from today. But the books to the right of the portrait are, of course, Shakespeare complete works. I hope you can read Shakespeare works in English. 
So the central position in Freud's library is for Shakespeare. When you look across his biography, Shakespeare is present in the first sheet of paper that we have written in Freud's hand. When Freud was 16 years of age, 1872, he fell in love with the mother of a girl who was his age, and he wrote to his friend who was present there when they were on holidays about the nonsensical Hamlet and me. Because he felt, as he was falling in love, there was something irrational about it, and he didn't like it at all. Hamlet here is something that's not good, something that he doesn't like, something that he would like to overcome. But you can see in the earliest letter that we have, he refers to Shakespeare. This is then the famous letter Freud wrote to Fleece, and we mentioned last week. This is the letter in which he explains why we like to go to theater and watch tragedy. And a long paragraph of the letter is about Hamlet. The same interpretation provided about Oedipus, that Oedipus would like to kill his father and have children with his mother, is Freud's interpretation of Hamlet. The one, again, about which he brags in the Moses paper. So he quotes a verse here, thus conscious does make cowards of us all, and tries to explain it. The explanation basically tells you that Hamlet is hysterical, Hamlet is neurotic. What Oedipus did, Hamlet wanted to do, but he was not brave enough. Yet his uncle did it, killed Hamlet's father, married Hamlet's mother. And then the reason for Hamlet to delay revenge is this problem. His uncle did what he wanted to do. Then there is some sort of unconscious identification and so on. This will never grow into a paper about Shakespeare. Freud, unfortunately, never wrote a paper devoted to Hamlet. What I just showed you as a letter will become a footnote in the interpretation of dreams. And Freud will give tasks to his followers to develop the idea. Ernst Jones, who was Welsh but lived in London, had the tragedy of one of his daughters dying in early childhood. So Jones wrote to Freud and Freud wrote back, that he can sympathize with that because he lost his favorite daughter and then immediately proceeded to you must find a task that will occupy you so that you forget about your pain. Why don't you write a book about Shakespeare, about Hamlet and Oedipus? And Jones was first struck with this complete lack of sympathy that was pronounced in the first sentence, but then, of course, wrote the book, because Freud's word was more important than anything else. Yet, wherever you look across Freud, you will find references, quotations, because sometimes they are not correct, slightly not, not correct, we believe that they are done by memory and not by real checking, but obviously Shakespeare was always in his mind and his memory. To my great sadness and embarrassment, Freud was obsessed by this completely ridiculous issue of Shakespeare's authorship. He started when he was very young. He wrote to his wife, to his then fiancée, Martha. Remember the words of an Anglo-Saxon poet who invented many gay and sad plays and himself acted in them, one William Shakespeare. Gay here means cheerful. So when he was young, he was not passionate about the authorship controversy. He believed Shakespeare was Shakespeare. Things were changing over time. 
And he wrote at the end of his life, 1938, in the Outline of Psychoanalysis. The name William Shakespeare is most probably a pseudonym behind which their lies conceal the great unknown. Edward the very Earl of Oxford, the man who has been regarded as the author of Shakespeare's works, lost a beloved and admired father when he was still a boy, and completely repudiated his mother, who contracted a new marriage soon after her husband's death. More or less the same message was written by Freud's daughter Anna in the year 1930, when Freud received the Goethe Prize in Frankfurt. You would expect he would say, thank you, Goethe was important for me, I'm a psychoanalyst, psychoanalysis and this and that. But no, he focuses on who was Shakespeare. By this time, as I told you last week, Freud had several operations. All in all, until 1939, he will have 15. And bit by bit, most of the tissue inside of his mouth was removed. So, large parts of his tongue, the whole lower jaw, and the large parts of the tissue inside, which I don't know what its name is. So, by late 1920s, everything was painful. Talking, chewing, swallowing, coughing, everything was painful. He had a prosthesis for the bone, a metal piece coming into the soft tissue instead of the bone. Everything was painful. And so when you read Jones' biography, he describes an evening when Jones, Ferenczi and Freud are sitting in Freud's study and they are discussing passionately for hours and Freud is talking for several hours very passionately about something. What is the topic? Shakespeare's identity. Madness. Maybe related to why he never wrote a paper on him? Difficult to say. Unfortunately, we cannot ask him. And I'm very sorry about this focus and this huge amount of energy devoted to this issue instead of interpreting plays. To make matters even worse, Jones writes, Freud thought about Shakespeare, quote, his countenance could not be that of an Anglo-Saxon, but he must be French, and he, Freud, suggested that the name was a corruption of Jacques Pierre. I mean, that's complete madness. That is, that has nothing to do with any realistic possibility. The plays obviously were not written in French. French reception of Shakespeare has always been such that, that, that they despised him more than anything else. There's no way this was possible. Freud, the only living person in the history of humankind who came up with this idea. There were many different ideas about Shakespeare, but this ridiculous idea had just one proponent. Yes? Um, why this authorship debate? What do you think? Why does it exist in general? Yeah, or maybe why was Freud interested? Why it ex exists in general is because during the age of Romanticism, we started believing the authors of artistic works or great scientists to be special persons, like Beethoven was, like Napoleon was, and so on, like Mozart was. And so people thought Shakespeare must have been a special person like that. And then they discovered there was nothing special about him. He was born in a village, he went to school there, he came to London, we don't know what he did for several years, he was an actor, he started writing plays, he had some friends or collaborators with whom he wrote plays because they earned their living on it and they had to be fast. There are years when he wrote four plays in a year. Julius Caesar, All's Well Then and Well, Henry V and Hamlet were written in one year. I'm not sure about whether these four exactly, but, but, but it could easily be that, that these four are 1599. And so they wrote together. Shakespeare would write the first act, or Shakespeare would, not, would write mass scenes or soliloquies. Someone else would write something else, and they would combine and deliver the play. The plays at that time were never written for publication. You would send them to a theater, get money from them, then give it to another theater in another city, get money from them, and so on. No one published plays at that time. 
And then he gave up at a certain moment when he was rich enough. And then he got drunk and died. No, honestly, he got drunk with two other guys and they contracted fever and of this fever he died. <coughs> Nothing very interesting. He was not talented as Mozart, he was not educated as Hegel, he was not... Um, I don't know, I wanted to say something about Beethoven, but he's outside of all categories. You cannot pigeonhole him into any category. And they, then they were not satisfied with that. They wanted genius alike romantic geniuses. So then theories started being made. Up to this moment, there are 60 different candidates for Shakespeare's authorship, including Queen Elizabeth, um, like she wrote it, like he was her lover, like their child wrote some of these, and I don't know, madness after madness after madness. Freud in the beginning believed Shakespeare's works were written by Francis Bacon. And then he gave it up. I'll, I'll show you a couple of these. I, I just somehow want you to see that it's not so difficult to understand. Some people can really buy it. Freud was not completely nuts. So, Freud spoke a little bit of Latin and even less of Greek. And yet, in his plays, you can see all about mythology and quotations in foreign languages and so on and so on. And then someone wrote a doctoral dissertation about these places in Bacon and in Shakespeare that are virtually the same. And that was considered to be a proof that Bacon wrote both. And the same thoughts once he expressed philosophically, the next time he expressed poetically. So what I want to show you, just a couple of examples, can you read them? Like the frets in the roofs of the houses. And then Hamlet, that majestical roof fretted with golden fire. Or, be so true to thyself as thou be not false to others. The famous Polonius speech in Hamlet, to thine own self be true. Or, the words, the world was on wheels, the same in Bacon and in Shakespeare. And our sorrows are our schoolmasters. And then in Richard II, give sorrows, leave a while to tutor me. And so on. Ulysses, sly in speech, deceive more slyly than Ulysses could. And so on. So I have nine of these here from a book I bought in Heidelberg many years ago that was published in 1912. So when Freud was around, the story was already important. The first proponent of the story is an unfortunate, from time to time, psychotic woman by the name of Celia Bacon. So she had the same last name as Francis Bacon. Freud believed in this for a time and then gave it up on the premise. If Bacon would have been the author of Shakespeare, then he would be the most powerful mind in the history of humankind, who was so important in philosophy and science, and then so powerful in poetry, then he would be larger than anyone. Personally, I feel this was very important for Freud, because who could be this guy who was working in the field of science, yet was awarded for his literary style? Freud himself. So if Bacon was the author of Shakespeare, then Bacon would be more powerful than, than Freud. And so Freud had to find another theory. This is Marlowe. Christopher Marlowe was the most important playwright at the moment when Freud appeared in London. And these are the places, the sentences or the verse from, for instance, Parabas, Jew of Malta, and the third part of Henry VI. The problem with the idea that Marlowe was the author of Shakespeare is that Marlowe was murdered in 1593. 
1593 is the beginning of Shakespeare's work. So then there are conspiracy theories about Marlowe traveling to Italy and sending his plays from Italy to London to be played under the name of Shakespeare, as if he would have attached them to an email and sent them from Italy very easily. The similarities are large and many of these places exist, most probably because Shakespeare was an actor and could easily have been playing in one of Marlowe's plays. Let me tell you briefly about this Oxford story. This Earl of Oxford, who was on the court and lost his father and so on, died in 1604. And Shakespeare produced plays for seven more years, until 1611, when he wrote The Tempest, and then after that returned to his village. Some of the later plays, like The Tempest, bear obvious resonance to what was going on in London at these years. And a dead person couldn't have written them, left them in the drawer, someone finds them in the drawer and then puts them on stage. It's impossible because, for instance, there is the famous Jamaica shipwreck, which is described in The Tempest 1611. The shipwreck was 1609. Yet Oxford is now so prominent that there is the so-called Oxfordian hypothesis, that like he is the author of Shakespeare. Why was this important for Freud? If Shakespeare was Shakespeare and not Oxford, then the author of tragedies would be a highly educated, noble person. Freud could not agree that someone coming from the provinces without university education could write Hamlet and Lear and Macbeth and so on. So again, who's come from the provinces and proved to conquer capitals. Freud. If it was possible for Freud, then he better be unique and we shouldn't allow this possibility to Shakespeare. Additionally, the story about personal family experience being the basis of artistic production fits psychoanalysis perfectly. That is what Freud wants to tell us. You will one day show us in your art what you experienced as a child and is deeply into your unconscious. If this does not fit, then Freud's theory is somehow wrong. If Shakespeare as a person does not have personal experiences that resemble Hamlet and Macbeth and King Lear and so on, then psychoanalytic theory doesn't work. So better accept this ridiculous theory and then psychoanalytic theory works, then accept what is rational and then you have to modify your theory. Is this clear? I, I have shortened the, the, the discussion very much. I would like to turn to some other ideas that might be far more important than, than this authorship debate. Harold Bloom is probably the most important contemporary American literary critic. Or at least his power of persuasion is the strongest. His rhetoric is amazing. And he's written dozens of books, definitely more than 100. And this one, The Western Can, Bloom wants to show us how the Western world was built. The Eastern canon is the Old and the New Testament. What is the Western canon? Bloom believes the Western canon starts with Dante and then he follows it all the way to Kafka and Borges and the second half of the 20th century. But the central point of the Western canon, in Bloom's opinion, is Shakespeare. Why so? Shakespeare has basically invented a language. If you try to read anything that is 50 years older than Shakespeare, you will be lost in a completely unusual combination of French and English that you can recognize the spelling, you, you have no idea what they're talking about. 
tried Thomas More not to talk about Chaucer. Shakespeare has invented hundreds, some claim about 3,000 new words, has invented phrases that you use every day when you speak English. It's unbelievable in a way when you read books about his linguistic proneness, and it's impossible to think of an author who could be compared to this. We don't have a case of a language, in a way, invented by a single author. In Shakespeare, one word can have five forms, and if you try, just to try any page of Shakespeare, any sonnet, one single sonnet of Shakespeare in English, and you will see that it is unbelievably good. Another point, Shakespeare, through his characters, asks all the most important questions. And many of these questions are here asked for the first time. How do you express your emotions? How do you establish social relationships in a new world? How do you express your identity? How do you know who you are? How do you tell other people who you are? How do you recognize who other people are? And so on and so on. In this way, he is our contemporary in a way that Marlowe or the ancients can never be, or some authors from the 18th or 19th century. And finally, probably the most important point is characterization. It was the English poet Shelley in the first half of 19th century who said that Shakespeare characters are more believable than people you will meet in the street. Can you imagine what he means to say? In the Western canon, there is a chapter about Freud. So the book is about Dante and Cervantes and Tolstoy and Kafka and so on, and Freud is among them. The chapter about Freud is entitled Freud, a Shakespearean reading. So what Bloom wants to tell us is that Freud is just a prose version of Hamlet. Whatever Freud told us, he had learned reading Shakespeare. Just in Shakespeare, it was expressed in verse and through characters, and Freud wanted to express it as a pseudo-natural science. So it is not Hamlet, so it is not that Hamlet suffers from Oedipus complex, it is that psychoanalysis suffers from Hamlet anxiety. Freud was trying to hide in every way possible that whatever he knew about anxiety and unconscious and defense mechanism, he found in Shakespeare, mostly in Hamlet. You can agree, you can disagree, but it's an essay that I think everyone interested in psychoanalysis should read. And the rest of the book is extremely interesting, I believe. And what's your opinion on that? I think that Freud, as I, as I mentioned already last week, Freud wanted to hide some of the important influences so that he would present himself as extremely original. I don't think he learned everything from Shakespeare. He learned a lot from Nietzsche, for instance, from Schopenhauer, from Goethe, and so on and so on. But Shakespeare was extremely important for him. And there is this habit in the world of psychoanalysis not to admit that you read someone, that you were influenced, that you learned from someone. Psychoanalysts, for some reason, want to present themselves as very original. In the world of natural science, they say everything that's extremely original most probably is extremely untrue because you stand on the shoulder of giants. You just make one step. Whenever you want to make a revolution, something is wrong about it. Einstein's come once per century. IPU people may remember Horst Kechel saying small steps, not huge jumps. Did he repeat that in lectures? So that's how science works, small steps. Don't try to make a revolution. So
So how does Shakespeare do that? How does he make these characters that we believe more than we believe people we meet in the street? Tragedy is based on larger-than-life personalities. So in the beginning, you see someone extremely wise or powerful or brave or whatever. And then this person deteriorates. And because he deteriorates from huge altitude, then the falling down is very painful to observe. If it were me to deteriorate, that wouldn't be very fun to watch. When Hamlet or Lear or someone else deteriorates, then you also suffer with that. And the famous phrasing coming from Hegel's aesthetics, Shakespeare characters are authors of themselves. So you can see them growing on the stage and becoming psychologically very believable. The most famous example, the most important example, is Iago from Othello. At the very beginning, that would be probably page two or page three of your edition, Iago says, I am not what I am. And then you see the rest of the play exercising his extremely strong will into becoming whoever he needs to become at a certain situation. And you see several characters believing the honest Iago would never do that. And then he does 10 times or 10,000 times worse than that. So this is the first situation when you see on stage someone becoming what he will be or what he does not want to be. Then there is something that Stephen Greenblatt calls strategic opacity. Shakespeare intentionally, in Greenblatt's opinion, starts plays without any explanation. You never know why the plot starts in that way. So King Lear, at a certain moment, decides to divide the kingdom in three parts. And we have no idea why. Why not four? Why divide it all? Othello and Desdemona get married and travel to Cyprus. He travels on one ship, she travels on another ship. We have no idea why. Hamlet, the end of the first act, decides that he is not sure whether to murder, not to murder. Is it madness? Is it reality? Is it hallucination and what it is? Until the end of the play, we have no idea what's the answer to any of these questions. So Greenblatt believes that Shakespeare wants to grab our attention by this strategic capacity. If it were obvious from the beginning why the main character does what he does, then the plays would be less interesting for the viewers and they would be less interesting for us today. That's one of the ways how he makes it so important. Finally, and this is just my short list, someone, someone really deep into Shakespeare would be able probably to provide far more explanations. Shakespeare describes the situation when social identity is not equal with the personal identity. In ancient Greece, in Middle Ages in, in, in Europe, your social identity is your definition. You say your name, you say where you come from, you say your last name, and everyone knows who you are. People never travel, people never change their names, they cannot change a profession because professions do not exist, and so on and so on. Both Oedipus in the tragedy and Socrates in reality believe that being banished from your community is the worst possible punishment because you do not exist outside of your community. All of a sudden, Shakespeare's time you do something horrible in England, you embark on a ship, you go to the United States, I mean, these are not the United States at that moment, you change your name and you forget about what you've done and you're a completely different person. 
This kind of experiment, psychological experiment, has never happened before in history. So what Shakespeare is describing to us is what happens at this moment one. I've lost my social identity and I have to discover my personal identity, but I have no idea how. There is no one who will tell me how to do that. No psychology, no psychotherapy, no uh, authors who have discovered that. Freud, in fact, inherited his Shakespeare from Goethe. German translations of Shakespeare started when Goethe was a boy, first prose and then poetic translation. And in the second half of the 18th century, Shakespeare was considered to be an honorary German. So Shakespeare, uh, German philosophers believed that the English did not understand Shakespeare correctly and fully, so they should take Shakespeare for their own. In the year 1771, in Frankfurt, Goethe, aged 22, gave a lecture in his father's house. The lecture, of course, was about Shakespeare. And Shakespeare was Goethe's rifle, so to say, Goethe's cannon against the French. Germany at that moment is not unified, has no common political history, and can hope only for the common cultural history. French consider Germans now, as today, barbarians. German culture, uh, French culture at that moment, at the height of its classicism, has very perfect form, everything in is, is in verse, Latin is quoted very frequently, everyone is extremely highly educated, and so on. So in order to fight that, the early German Romantics come to the idea that their weapon against the French will be Shakespeare. Born in the village, without any university education, mixes verse and prose, mixes sublime and everyday stuff, does everything they believe on the basis of inspiration. So Goethe says, this is diminutive, as, as, as most of you probably recognize. Little French, why do you try to imitate the antique tragedy? It is too large for you. You're too soft. You're too tender for it. Here's a guy who speaks from the nature. Here's a guy who speaks from the woods of Arden where the magic and the nature are. And he brings the inspiration. And that's the beginning of German Romanticism. So, it's our Shakespeare. There is nothing as natural as Shakespeare's characters. Even nature itself cannot produce anything as natural as Shakespeare's characters are. We here present in Goethe's lecture, we are not as natural as the characters are. And then the famous novel. Who's read, who's read the novel? Do you know it? Wilhelm Meister? It is not being read in German grammar schools? No? Yes? yes? Partly. Partly. The basic <laughs> question of the novel, is it possible to put Hamlet on stage? Wilhelm Meister is a son of a rich merchant family, and he should become a merchant. He goes on to travel to sign a contract and earn his family money, and then he meets a theater company and joins them, and someone gives him Shakespeare to read, and his life is transformed. And from then on, he thinks about German theater and how is it possible to put Hamlet on stage? If you go to Weimar, we will see the theater as the center of the city and Goethe and Schiller shaking hands in front of it. And that's the space, that's the spot where the German state and culture were born. 
And then the English don't want to hear about that. And they want to reappropriate Shakespeare. So Coleridge writes our own Shakespeare with the very strong exclamation mark, which means Germans back off. Don't take our poet from us. But basically, English interpretations from the first half of the 19th century are the German interpretations. I'll return to that in a second. This is a poem from 1844 entitled Hamlet, which starts with the sentence Deutschland ist Hamlet. One meaning of the word is Germany cannot make the decision. We are thinking about how to unite and when to unite, but we cannot make the decision. So this is 1844. It will happen 27 years later. And in this sense, you can think of Bismarck as Fortinbras. Bismarck will do without any hesitation what those guys before him didn't. Another point. Germany's Hamlet in terms that the self-reflective attitude is absolutely natural for German culture. In the span from Luther to Thomas Mann, the basic idea of German culture is the idea of innerlichkeit, that you have something inside which is invisible and then you should observe and try to cultivate. Absolute hamletizing, so to say. Now, Here's the interpretation. This is how Goethe understands Hamlet. The effects of a great action laid upon a soul unfit for the performance of it. There is an oak tree planted in a costly jar which should have borne only pleasant flowers in its bosom. The roots expand, the jar is shivered. In the psychoanalytic interpretation, Hamlet will be neurasthenic, feeble, weak. He's not courageous, he's not bold and strong enough to do what his father would do without hesitation. So as a matter of fact, Freud's Shakespeare is good as Shakespeare. Freud's obsession with Shakespeare is the continuation of his rootedness in the German culture. I end up with just two Brief points. So Freud, when you look at what he likes most, is very old-fashioned. He's interested in things that he can contemplate and rationally understand and then control and conquer and explain. At least he believes explain. He's into sculpture and literature and painting. No mention of theater or music and no contemporaries. Apart from the correspondence with Schnitzler, more or less, we don't know anything about his interest in contemporaries. Never goes to cinema, never goes to the opera, never goes to concerts, doesn't watch contemporary plays, doesn't look at contemporary painters, and so on. Thank you. This has lasted a little bit longer, but we've started quite after the, 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 the appointed 7 o'clock. Are there any questions? Despite the long story. It's been enough for tonight. Good. Thank you. I hope this was useful and I hope to see you next week.